Well, greetings, everyone. This is Pastor Mike Jones of Harvest Community Church in Birmingham, Alabama, where we are a community of worshipers committed to Christ, commissioned to serve, and called to pray without ceasing. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. I'm going to read a passage of scripture that will serve as our call to worship. And it's a very familiar passage of scripture in Psalm 24. Psalm 24. The earth is the Lord's and its fullness, the world and those who dwell therein. For he has founded it upon the seas and established it upon the waters. Who may ascend into the hill of the Lord or who may stand in his holy place? He who has clean hands and a pure heart, who has not lifted up his soul to an idol, nor sorns deceitfully, he shall receive blessing from the Lord and righteousness from the God of his salvation. This is Jacob, the generation of those who seek him, who seek your face. Lift up your heads, O you gates, be lifted up, you everlasting doors, and the King of glory shall come in. Who is this King of glory? The Lord strong and mighty, the Lord mighty in battle. Lift up your heads, O you gates, lift up, you everlasting doors, and the King of glory shall come in. Who is this King of glory? The Lord of hosts. He is the King of glory. I don't know who I'm talking to today, but there might be someone who's a little bit discouraged and feels defeated. Maybe you feel down. Maybe you feel like... Uh, uh, life is coming in on you and it's a little bigger than you thought it was. It's overwhelming you. You think you're, you're, being, you're, you're drowning in a sea of issues. Lift up your heads, O ye gates, and be ye lifted up, ye everlasting doors, and the King of glory shall come in. Who is this King of glory? The Lord of hosts. He is the King of glory. We worship a King who is mighty, who is, is omnipotent, all-powerful, all-knowing and ever-present. And He is God. Let's come and worship Him. There's deliverance and there's power in our praise. I plan on worshiping Him today. Do you plan on joining me? This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in Him. Let's prepare our hearts for worship today. Good morning, my name is Caitlin Carver and my favorite Bible verse is Psalms 147, chapter 3. He heals the brokenhearted and binds up their wounds. This is my favorite Bible verse because it shows that God is always there for us. Good morning, my name is Maya Tarver and my favorite Bible verse is Philippians 4.13. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. This is my favorite Bible verse because it reminds me that I can do anything I put my mind to. Good morning. My favorite Bible verse is Proverbs 16, 9. A man's heart plans his way, but the Lord directs his steps. I love this Bible verse because it just tells us that even though we may have the best laid plans, we always need to pray and ask God for guidance. Because as we all know, sometimes God changes our direction and we may not understand it at the time, but in the end, we always find out that God does know best. Hi, my name is Rebecca Dale. My favorite verse is Proverbs 9.9. 9. Instruct the wise and they'll become wise. They teach the righteous and they'll learn even more. The reason why this is my favorite verse is because I feel like it builds off of a lot of key principles in life and I feel like you can take it either very seriously or a lot less with a lot less boundaries and I just feel like it's a good verse to live by and to always keep in the back of your mind. Good morning. Uh, my favorite verse or one of my favorite verses um, is found in the telling of the parable of the lost son. Uh, that's Luke chapter 15, uh, but the verse uh, that, uh, uh, it, but it's verse 20, and it says, And he rose and came to his father, but when he was still a great way off, his father saw him and had compassion and ran and fell 
on his neck and kissed him. Now, I know what you're saying. This isn't your typical verse that you would quote, go around quoting. Uh, but like I said, it's something that has stuck with me for many years. I read it when I was a, uh, probably about seventh or eighth grade. And at that time, I was impressed by the words the author and the Holy Spirit used uh, to describe the embrace of the Father. It says that he fell on his neck and he kissed him. Um, and uh, not having a relationship with my own father, I, you know, I thought, man, if this is how the Heavenly Father loved us, uh, I'm all in. This is what I want. You know, was, I want that type of relationship. Uh, but now, um, after all these years, uh, I'm on the other end of the spectrum, and uh, we're, you know, at the end of our child raising years and. Uh, instead of relating to the son, I probably relate to the father. So when I read this verse, um, it's I'm still impressed by the words, but it's the words right before where it says, but he, the son, was still a great way off. His father saw it and had compassion and ran. Um, I can spot my kids a hundred yards away. They're playing volleyball, kicking a soccer ball, or marching in the core cadets um, and I get excited you know I know what it's like to get excited uh, after you haven't seen them for a while uh, and so when I read this now I think wow uh, in all my sinful ways if I can feel this way how much more does the father feel towards me so I like this verse because it's an example of how the scripture is alive Relatable to our daily um, activities, and, you know, even a simple person can have me. So, thank you. Be safe. Some folks will say it's all symbolic, or they'll say it's symbolism, yada, 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 yada. Or they'll even say, don't take it literal. I mean, does the Bible really want you to cut off your arm if it offends you? But we need to put more action into the Bible. Like this one time, this kid was bullying my little girl at school, and I said, hey, baby girl, remember how David did Goliath and he picked up those stones? The next time that kid messes with you, you need to pick up some stones. And not just any stones, pick up some big stones and throw them at her head and knock her down to the ground, David style. See, that's putting the Bible into action because that's what the Bible says. I mean, this one time my neighbor had one of my Blu-rays and he said he forgot to give it back. And I said, no, uh-uh, that's still it. And the Bible says that if a man steals, then he owes you 10 times the amount he took. So, I got 10 of his DVDs, and I'm not giving them back. I borrowed them from him. Now, you know, me and my neighbor, we don't talk so much anymore. But that's okay, because I'm just trying to live my life by the word. Um, what about what Jesus said, you know, in the New Testament about turning the other cheek? Say what? Oh, I don't think I've ever seen that in the Bible. Um, I like Jacob when he fought the lion all night and he killed it, but it kind of bit him in the side because he was kind of walking with a limp a little bit. But then Nathan told him to pray toward the clock and then God saved him. That's when he became king. I don't see what the big deal is about memorizing scriptures or carrying around a big old heavy Bible anyway. These days I can look up several verses on my iPad, my iPod, and when I get to church, it's on screen anyway. So, what do I need a Bible for? It's so passe these days. You don't think having your own Bible helps you plant God's Word in your own heart? 
Um, you mean like Psalm 119, 105, your word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path? Oh, I'm sorry, I guess you do have a lot of scripture memorized. Nope, just Googled it. And then, I like when, well, you know, Jacob begot Jesse, Jesse begot Joshua, and um, he had twins, and then Samson and Moses and David came, and he was the great, great, great grandfather of King James. He was the king of Israel. He wrote the Bible. Oh yes, I'm a great big fan of the Bible. I mean, it's like the number one bestseller for years. And my family and I pride ourselves on being very well read. I think I have possibly one or two of them around the house, I'm sure. I know there's one in my living room. It's a big, beautiful, rich brown leather one that we don't allow any fingerprints on or anything. But it looks great in that room. It has an antique feel and it goes well with the decor in there. Why I'm such a big fan, I became a fan on Facebook too. I'm that big of a fan. So, um, how often do you read the Bible? I'm a big, big fan. King James was king of England. King James was from England? Wait, were the Jews from England? This is my grandfather's Bible. He used to read from it to me when I was a boy. He taught me the importance of hiding God's word in my heart. Thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. So as I partake of my uh, physical daily bread, I make sure I take time to feed on the spiritual bread of God that, that the word gives me. What's that expression they use? Basic instructions before leaving earth? I couldn't live my life without it.
Well, let's get right into the Word of God today. So if you have your Bibles, open them up quickly to Mark chapter 5. We're going to look at verses 1 through 8. Mark chapter 5, verses 1 through 8. Then they came to the other side of the sea, to the country of the Gadarenes. And when he had come out of the boat, immediately there met him out of the tombs a man with an unclean spirit, who had his dwelling amongst the tombs, and no one could bind him, not even with chains. Because he had often been bound with shackles and chains, and the chains had been pulled apart by him, and the shackles broken pieces, neither could anyone tame him. And always, night and day, he was in the mountains and in the tombs, crying out and cutting himself with stones. When he saw Jesus from afar, he ran and worshipped him. And he cried out with a loud voice and said, What have I to do with you, Jesus, Son of the Most High God? I implore you by God that you do not torment me. For he said to him, Come out of the man, unclean spirit. Let's pray. Father, we ask that you would speak to us through your word today. We ask that Jesus will be glorified and that he would be lifted up, that we might see him and seeing him, we might believe on him. And in believing on him, we might be saved. This is our prayer in Jesus name. Won't you say amen, amen and amen. We're continuing on in our series entitled Remembering Jesus. But today's message is entitled, Help for the Hopeless. Help for the Hopeless. Men and women, I don't know about you, but I've lived uh, kind of in limbo since March. There is uh, economic uncertainty. There's uh, a future that is uncertain. There's uncertainty with regard to this pandemic. There's uncertainty economically. There's uncertainty uh, politically. There's uncertainty as we enter into the first few weeks of this new school year. Everything is in limbo and everything is uncertain. And I do know the schemes of the devil and I know the tactics of the enemy. And one of his tactics is to cause hurt and to cause pain and to allow suffering and uncertainty to bring about despair. And men and women, this man here this demoniac who lived in the country and the region of the Gadarenes was in despair. I don't know what caused it. I don't know what uh, uh, he felt. I don't know what tragic event motivated this, but Satan's scheme is to call hurt, cause hurt and damage to allow difficulty, to allow uh, there to be tragic events to allow us to be uh, in fear. And that's where he finds his toehold. So whatever this man experienced, he finds himself now with eight very, very serious characteristics. And so if you were to look at the scriptures, you would see that there were eight things that characterized this man. Number one, he had an unclean spirit, according to verse two. Number two, he, his dwelling was in the tombs. Number three, no one could bind him, not even with chains. Number four, he had often been bound with shackles and chains. That means they often tried to restrain him and he was uncontrollable. Number five, the chains had been pulled apart by him and the shackles broken by him. No, he was out of control. Number six, nobody could tame him, according to verse four. And then seven, always night and day, he was in the mountains and in the tombs. He was isolated and alone. And then lastly, it says night and day, he would cry out and he would cut himself. So there was an outward expression trying to relieve inward pain. And men and women, I don't know if if you are experiencing anything like this or you have loved ones that are experiencing things like this. This is a man that characterizes individuals with addictions, alcohol abuse, drug abuse, addictions to uh, to to uh, promiscuity, sex and pornography, uh, addicted to spending, addicted to uh, all kinds of things. And living out of control. And men and women, I believe that we need to remember Jesus. 
I remember, I, I, I believe that there is help for the hopeless, help for the helpless and help for those who are homeless. <laughs> Men and women, the, the, the characteristics of this man here were, were the, that he was homeless, that he was helpless and that he was hopeless. Look down at verse number three. It said he had his dwelling amongst the tombs. That means he didn't live in a home. That means he wasn't with his family. He was homeless. And listen, many women, we can be homeless and still live in a house. It means that we dwell with those that aren't going anywhere. Dead people aren't going anywhere. It means that we're hanging out with the wrong crowds. It means that we're, we're, we're involved in the wrong things with the wrong people. He was homeless. He was homeless. He had his dwelling amongst the tombs. He lived his life amongst the dead. He was sad, lonely, hurting, longing, unloved, unwanted. He had a tragic experience. And men and women, be careful. The, the, the schemes of the devil are to cause you to be isolated and not be around people, not be around positivity, not be around those who will uplift you instead of bringing you down. Not only was he homeless, but he was helpless. Look at verse four. It said he had often been bound with shackles and with chains. And it says the chains were pulled apart by him and the shackles broken in pieces. And verse four, it ends up by saying, neither could anyone tame him. Men, men and women, I'll start with the last one. It says, neither could anyone tame him. People tried to tame him because this individual had people that cared about him, but he wasn't listening and he wasn't abiding. He wasn't taking in the advice. He, listen, they tried their best to tame him, but he was helpless. The chains couldn't help him. The, 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 uh, uh, the, the, the shackles couldn't help him. The loved ones couldn't help him. He was helpless. And men and women, he was out of control. He was the one that broke the chains. He was the one that broke the shackles. He was the one that didn't listen to advice. He was out of control. And he was led by his desires and his appetites. And they ruled him. And although people cared about him and wanted to help him, he couldn't be helped. I, I think that I'm talking about someone. You may have some loved ones who are addicted to something and they have the same characteristics. They're hanging out with the wrong folk. You've tried to restrain them. You have tried to convince them that they're going down the wrong road and that their behavior is destructive. And yet nothing can tame them. He was homeless. He was helpless, but he was also in, to some degree hopeless. Look down at verse five. It says always night and day. He was in the mountains and in the tombs, crying out and cutting himself with stones. He was so hopeless that he was crying out for help and crying out because of his pain and his despair, crying out because of his situation. And then he went so far as to begin cutting himself. And many people say that, that, that cutting is an outward expression trying to relieve inward pain. Many say 80% of those that cut are women between the ages of 18 and 25. That life has gotten so big that they can't handle it. That they actually believe that cutting themselves will release that inward sorrow and that inward pain that torments them in their soul. And yet... It does nothing but causes more and more pain. They become on a vicious cycle trying to relieve issues. And men and women, during this pandemic and during the situation we find ourselves in now, we ought to be very, very mindful that people are hurting and it may not even be voiced. That people are going through despair. That's why we got to check on people. That's why we got to ask hard questions. That's why we've got to love on people and encourage people and motivate people and not settle for, for easy answers to where people are. Because many people could be living in quiet desperation because nobody has asked the condition of their souls. This man had all of the outward trappings that screamed to people that something was wrong on the inside. 
And so he was homeless, he was helpless, and he was hopeless. But the good news is, is that he had a helper. He had a helper and his name was Jesus. Look down at the scriptures in verses 6 through 8. When he saw Jesus from afar, he ran and worshipped him. Evidently, he knew that Jesus could help him. Evidently, he knew that Jesus could release him from bondage. He knew that Jesus was a deliverer. He knew that Jesus was sufficient. He knew that Jesus was all powerful. He knew who Jesus was. And the scripture says he cried out with a loud voice. And this is the demon crying out. What have I to do with you, Jesus, son of the most high God? I implore you by God that you do not torment me. For Jesus said to him, or he said to him, come out of the man, unclean spirit. Now, men and women, there was a helper. This man had a helper and his name was Jesus. Men and women, there is power in the name of Jesus. The name of Jesus is Yeshua, and it actually means Jehovah, our salvation, or Jehovah, our deliverer. And the name is so important that in 1 John chapter 4, it says that anyone who does not believe that Jesus has come in the flesh is the Antichrist. Well, what does that have to do with anything? Well, Jesus is Jehovah, our salvation. And what John is saying is that if you don't believe that Jehovah, our salvation has come in the flesh, then you are against the Christ, the anointed one. Jesus, Jehovah, our salvation has come in the flesh. His name is Jesus, the Christ who was born in Bethlehem, grew up in Nazareth, died on the cross, rose from the dead, and now offers deliverance to anyone who will trust him. This demoniac knew who Jesus was. This demoniac needed deliverance. This demoniac ran to his helper and called him Jesus. You see, Mark, in his gospel here, He states his case about who Jesus is in chapter one, verse one, when he says the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the son of God. And he uses it as a theme throughout his gospel. In chapter one, verse 24, there was a man with an unclean spirit in the synagogue and the, the unclean spirit spoke out and said, let us alone. What do we have to do with you, Jesus of Nazareth? Did you come to, to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. The evil spirits know who Jesus is. The evil spirits know what Jesus can do. In chapter 3, verse 11, there's a man with an unclean spirit. And the unclean spirits, whenever they saw Jesus, they would fall down before him and cry out saying, You are the Son of God. These evil spirits know who Jesus is. Whatever it's tormenting you, it knows what Jesus is. In, in chapter 14, verses 61 and 62, it says, And again, the high priest asked him, saying to him, Are you the Christ, the Son of the Blessed? Jesus said, I am. And you will see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of the power, coming with the clouds in heaven. See, Jesus said, I am. I know who I am, and you know who I am too. But men and women, philosophy is not going to help us. Self-help is not going to help us. Trying to find a new gadget isn't going to help us. Trying to find a new scheme isn't going to help us. Trying to find the latest fad isn't going to help us. Jesus the Christ will help us. And this man knew he ran to to Jesus from afar off. And the scripture says in verse 6, he worshipped him. And men and women, Jesus knew who, who, who these evil spirits were. This man had a helper and his name was Jesus. He needed somebody to rescue him. He needed someone to do for him what he could not do for himself. He needed someone to reach further down than he could reach up. He needed someone who would come out of that boat and into that graveyard and pull him out. He needed Jesus. 
he found himself only feet away from the only one in the universe who could help him. And his name was Jesus. I thank God that Jesus wasn't content just to leave that man naked and out of his right mind. But notice what Jesus did for him. He calmed him. Afterwards, after he, he cast out all of those demons out of him, 2,000 into the pigs, that, that, that the man was now calm and sitting down. Not only was he calmed, but he was clothed. The scripture says he was now clothed and in his right mind. He was calmed, he was clothed, and he was controlled. He was no longer controlled by demonic activity, but he was controlled by the spirit of the living God. He was controlled by the Holy Spirit because Jesus had delivered him. Not only was he controlled, but he was also commissioned. He told Jesus, Jesus, I'll follow you wherever you go. And Jesus said, no, I don't want you to follow me wherever, wherever I go. I want you to go back home and I want you to have a ministry amongst your family. And many women, I believe that the ministry of the, the walking wounded always need the ministry of the walking healed. I'll say that again. The ministry of the walking wounded or the walking wounded always need the ministry of the walking healed. If you are wounded today. If you have difficulty and despair today, the best ministry is finding someone who has your ailment, who has had what you're going through, who has experienced your torment, and they found victory in Jesus, and they can help you find that same victory too. Many women, he was homeless, he was helpless, he was hopeless, but he did have a helper. And many women, we have a helper today too. And his name is Jesus. Jesus wants to deliver us. Jesus wants to, to make us clothed and in our right mind. Jesus wants to deliver us from what torments us. And Jesus does not want us to live in defeat and despair. He wants us to live in victory. He gave this demoniac victory. He gave this demoniac a new insight. And I'll close with this. There's something interesting about this story. It says in the very beginning that Jesus went to the country of the Gadarenes, which is a Gentile nation. The scripture says that he was ministering to a man who lived in the tombs. He was around dead folk. The scripture says that not only was he around dead folk, but there were pigs around. All three of those things would cause that to be an area where Jesus as a Jew would deem unclean. The Gentiles were unclean. Anything dead was unclean. The pigs were unclean. I am so glad that Jesus is not threatened by anything that is unclean. Jesus is not thrown by anything that is unclean. Jesus is not taken back by anything that is unclean. Jesus says, I will go into that unclean place and because of my presence, I'll clean it up. Because of my presence, I will cause it to be a holy place. And men and women, all of us were deemed unclean outside of Jesus Christ. All of us were dead. All of us were outside of the promises of God. All of us lived in a country that was unclean and we lived amongst the people that were unclean. And Jesus says, I want to come and clean you up. But it takes faith. First of all, we've got to admit that we are helpless and hopeless. We've got to admit that. We've got to admit that everything that we've tried falls short. And secondly, we've got to believe We've got to run to Jesus and worship him just like this demoniac. Men and women, I bid you Jesus today. I bid you to run to him today. Place your faith on in him today. You could be a believer already today and you find yourself in bondage. Run to Jesus. Worship him. It could be that you've never made a commitment to Jesus Christ, but you want to do that today. You can simply play, pray with me and invite Jesus Christ to come into your life by faith 
And I guarantee you, if you do it by faith, running to him, worshiping him, yielding to him, saying, Lord, I want you to come and change me. He will. Let's pray. Father God, I thank you so much for this opportunity. I pray, Lord God, that if there's anyone under the sound of my voice that wants to receive Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord, they would simply pray, Lord Jesus, I need you. Thank you for dying on the cross for my sins. I now open the door of my life and receive you as my Savior and Lord. Thank you for forgiving my sins and giving me eternal life. Take control of the throne of my life and make me the kind of person you want me to be. This is my prayer in Jesus name. Won't you say amen, amen, and amen. Men and women, until next week, remember Jesus. He gives help to the helpless, help for the hopeless. He is Jesus, the son of God. We are-